Today we're going to be talking about snowboard seasons. If you've ever found yourself wondering, do I have time? Where would I live? How do I afford it? Where would I go? If you've ever asked any of these questions, then follow through this video and I'm going to talk through some of my top tips on how to save money, where to go, and how to work out what you want out of your snowboard season. The first thing you need to work out is what are your priorities? Why are you choosing to do a snowboard season? And once you have the answer to that question, you're gonna be able to start working out the answers to other questions like where do you live? How do you pay for it? Where do you work? Where do you go, etc. I would say the first step of planning a snowboard season would be to get a piece of paper, write down why, why you wanna do a season, what you're hoping to get out of it, and then prioritize all of those things in order. Some of the things you might be hoping to achieve from your snowboard season might be getting better at snowboarding, having an experience to remember, traveling. You might be looking to set up a life long term in the mountains and live that lifestyle. Once you've worked out why you want to do a snowboard season, you're going to be in a much better position to work out how you're going to afford it, where you're going to work, and also where you actually want to go. For example, if you're just looking for a one year experience, it might make a lot more sense for you to save up before your trip and make the most out of it and not feel like you're missing out on anything. Whereas if you're hoping to make a career teaching snowboarding, you probably want to be getting a job, getting some experience in that and looking at taking some courses to improve your teaching. So now you know why you're doing your season. The next thing to look at is going to be how you're going to afford it. That normally comes into kind of two categories. I would say work before your season or work on your season. And obviously you can always do a combination of both. In terms of working before your season, the advantage is you're gonna have full free time and not miss out on anything during your season. However, you are gonna to need to save up and sacrifice some time before your season, which won't work if you're doing back-to-back -back seasons. The first option to consider if you're wanting to save up and work before your season is to continue in your current job up until you go. The chances are you've already got some skills in that area, you're gonna know your own company or whatever, and that's probably going to be a more efficient way, a more pleasurable way for you to make money. You'll generally be getting paid more and you'll, as a result, be able to save up the money required for your season faster. The next option I'd look at would be working at a local sports facility, for example, your dry slope, your local snow dome, etc., where you're going to be doing something that you actually like, meeting people with the same interest as you who are probably going to have contacts and experience doing seasons etc and it's generally going to be a more pleasurable experience for you working in the snow sports industry if that's something that interests you. Another one that I see a lot particularly with a lot of my Australian friends is they'll work laboring on a construction site etc it's hard work however it'll get you physically fit ready for the season and normally it pays quite well you can normally pick up a lot of hours in a short period of time which is going to make that saving process a lot easier other things to consider are delivery drivers supermarkets or basically any job you can get your hands on and just take as many hours as you can and get as much money saved up as possible if we're talking working on your season so maybe you've saved up some money before you go but you haven't got enough money to pay for your whole season or you're looking to do more than one season in a row, you're going to need to look at some kind of option for working while you're away. First one I'm going to discuss is instructing and teaching snowboarding, which has a huge number of advantages in the respect that it's really rewarding, you're doing something that you like. However, if your goals for the season are set around your own riding progression, you're going to have a lot less time working as an instructor to ride for yourself. And if you're there in the short term to ride for yourself, it's probably not actually going to work out that well. It's always a very difficult area to juggle because long term, I'm interested in coaching snowboarding and I like teaching snowboarding. However, I also want a lot of time to ride for myself and push my own riding. So the way I've found a balance to this is to do back-to-back -back winters and spend one winter in a year teaching and coaching and one winter in the year riding myself and then I sort of save my money up when I'm coaching and then I don't work as much when I'm on my sort of riding part of the year and that way I get to increase my coaching experience and do that which I really like and it's really rewarding but also I get time to ride for myself. The next 
job opportunity I want to talk about is shaping in the snow park. If you're interested in riding in the park, this can be a good option. You'll generally have a bit of time during the day between morning and lunchtime shape and then between lunchtime and afternoon shape, depending on the result, where you'll be able to ride yourself. It will mean that you're digging out the park on powder days. So if your focus is to go get endless powder days and ride back country, it's probably not the job for you. You will also work long hours normally for not that much pay doing hard work. However, if you're interested in the park, it's super rewarding and it can be a good way to get yourself involved in the scene. Next option I'm going to talk about is being a chalet host. So a lot of people will, their first experience of the idea of a seasons will be a movie like Chalet Girl and they'll choose to work in a chalet. It's not actually something I've personally done, but you've got the disadvantage of you often don't have a lot of time to go riding. However, you, you will have sorted out your accommodation. You'll quite often have a nice lifestyle. If you've chosen to do seasons because of the lifestyle and the general environment, and you want to live in the mountains, this could be a good option for you. Another good one if you want time to ride during the day is working in a bar or a cafe or something that's open in the evenings. Have you got to consider when you're going to finish? If you finish at four in the morning, the chances are you're going to be too tired to then go riding the next morning. It does also offer a huge amount of social options. You'll get to know everyone and you'll be the first one to know all the gossip in town. Another good option is to work in a snowboard shop or as a glass collector or cleaner in the afternoons when you're not going to be riding but you're not super late at night. These jobs often won't pay the most because anybody can kind of do them. However, if you're just looking to make a little bit of money to kind of keep yourself topped up and you've saved up a lot of money before the season, this can be a good option. The last thing I'd consider in terms of financial situation while on a season is have you got some kind of personal skill or whatever that you can offer. So if you're a good photographer, a good filmer, if you've got carpentry skills or whatever the chances are there are going to be people in the resort who are needing these skills and you might be able to get some ad hoc work doing that. I think when you're looking at what work you want to do on your season it's vital that you look at why you're doing your season in the first place and find something that fits with that as well as something that you're happy to do. So you might decide that your key priority on your season is your snowboard progress yourself and you might, as a result, find that working in an apres ski in the afternoon or cleaning one or two days a week gives you the most riding time and flexibility, even though it's not the most interesting job for you. And that might be a good fit for you. Somebody else who's looking to make a career and move to the mountains for the rest of their life might want to look at working as a snowboard instructor or starting to shape in the park to then get a career as a park designer, etc. And that would be more suitable to them. Somebody who's there for the lifestyle might choose that they want to work in a bar, get a good social experience or in a chalet, even if they don't have as much time to ride themselves. Now that you've got some idea of what work you want to do and why you're doing your season, you're ready to look at where you actually want to go. So obviously if you want to ride a lot of powder, you're going to want to look at a resort that has got good terrain and has got good snowfall. If you're interested in progressing in the park, you want to look at the snow park that the resort offers, but not just what features they have. I'd recommend looking into how long the chairlift for the park is and kind of trying to get some information about the queues. For a lot of people, a long lap with a wide variety of features is going to be the most important to them. However, if you're like me and you're fun snowboarding centers around your progression. Choosing a maybe slightly smaller park with a faster lift and less people where you can lap a small number of obstacles a lot of times is going to be more important. Another factor to consider when looking at which resort you want to do your season in is the weather. Have a look at when spring starts, how long the season goes, how much snowfall do they tend to get. These factors are also going to be very important when making that decision. I'd highly recommend researching individual resorts yourself and finding out what works for you. However, as a rough guide, Japan is known for having a lot of powder, but the parks tend to be less good and there's generally less steep terrain. 
Both Europe and North America are chained to offer a wide range of terrain and powder resorts as well as good snow parks and often you can find somewhere that has a combination of the two. The American parks tend to, with the exception of Lax, which is in Europe, tend to be the longer parks with more variety of features and Europe tends to have more of the smaller parks with more condensed features. However, that's just a sort of tendency, it really depends on where you go. The other thing to consider about your location is when you actually want to do your trip, you might have decided that you want to save up and just go for a two month trip and you might be studying or you might have a long term work commitment so you might only have time in say August and September so you would want to look at resorts that are open at that time that are suitable so the European glaciers, the Mount Hood glacier in the US, Australia and New Zealand and also South America would kind of be your options to look for so and within that you can then work out what suits you. You're also going to need to look at visa requirements to teach. You're going to need a working visa whereas if you are hoping to save up and maybe do a little bit of cleaning you may be able to get this as cash work without needing a working visa. The next area we're going to look at is accommodation. You're going to need to find somewhere to live unless you're one of the hugely talented individuals that I know that have done an entire season with no accommodation, which is a, quite an impressive task. There's a few different accommodation options on a season, and this will partly be dependent on your work and where you choose to go. So a lot of resorts or companies will provide staff accommodation, particularly if you're instructing or if you're working for a hotel or a chalet, they'll usually provide your accommodation. Some rental stores will also provide accommodation. The advantage with staff accommodation is it's all sorted for you. You don't need to search for it. It's usually fairly cheap. There's generally a good social atmosphere if you'll be living with other seasonaires. And so if you're there for the lifestyle, that's going to be a key kind of attraction to staff accommodation for you and may even affect you may want to choose somewhere to work that provides staff accommodation for that reason. One note with staff accommodation is try and find out what it is. Not everywhere provides as good a staff accommodation as each other and some of them tend to be overcrowded, noisy and may not be suitable for all people. Your next option is try to find an apartment or a shared house with some of your friends. These can be quite hard to find and quite pricey in ski resorts. However, you'll find a lot of resorts that have a lot of season airs. People will own large houses and you'll be able to rent individual rooms in them, which is an option, especially if you're not going with a group. And that, again, will provide a good social scene. I would, again, add the caveat like staff accommodation, be aware there'll be a lot of young seasoners there, the chances are there will be parties in your house, etc. So if you're not going to suit well to that, I would probably try and find an apartment privately rather than a large shared house. Your last kind of option is a van. Increasingly more and more people doing seasons are converting vans or buying caravans, etc. to live in. You do have the issue of parking depending on the country you're in. Sometimes you can get away with just Free parking, if you've got the correct charge up facilities yourself, solar power, etc. Cost wise, van life can often look like a good option. Okay, I don't have to pay rent, but having looked into it myself, if you add up the cost of insurance, potentially paying to park your van to get electricity, etc., and then the extra cost on food, etc., with its storing. And then the fact that it's cold, it doesn't necessarily always work out cheaper for what you're getting. It does, however, provide you a huge amount of flexibility. So for those of you who are doing a season looking for an experience and travel and are maybe only doing one season and you want to visit as many different resorts as possible in your region, the van can provide you a huge amount of flexibility to do that. Now that you've answered a lot of these questions about where you'd be living, where you want to go, how you're going to make money, where you're going to live. You can kind of categorize your season probably into a few of these categories. You could do a full kind of eight month season 
from October to May. There's normally pre-season parks right up to late spring parks. And if you find a sort of region that has winter resorts as well as glaciers or whatever, you can quite often extend your season for quite a long time. You've got the sort of standard winter season from December through till April. You've got the kind of option of doing like a two month trip and pick two months of the season that you're most interested in. So if you want to ride park, maybe go in the spring. If you want to ride powder, go in December, January, February, etc. The other option is a summer season. So if you're busy in the winter, you've maybe got a full-time job or you're studying or whatever, you can look at going to New Zealand, to Australia, South America, or to any of the European or American glaciers and still do a two month season. Now the bit you've all been waiting for, cost saving tips. So the first thing I'm gonna say about cost saving tips is these apply on your season and before. If you start to apply these before you go away, you're gonna be able to save up a lot more money a lot quicker before embarking on your season. Transport, do you really need it? If you're gonna live in a van, obviously you're gonna have transport, you need your van. However, if you're planning on living in a ski resort for six months, the chances are there's going to be free ski buses, etc. to get around the resort and you probably do not need your car. You can save yourself a lot of money on fuel and insurance, etc. by leaving it at home or even better selling it. Obviously, if you're hoping to travel around and sightsee and see different resorts, different towns in another country, you may need a car. The next area is food. A huge amount of your money is going to go onto food. So I'd recommend working out which food is cheapest at which supermarkets when you first get there and then trying to do your shopping accordingly. Consider the nutritional impact as well of your food. So you're probably not going to be able to survive on just smart price pasta, with no vegetables and no sort of substance when going out and snowboarding or skiing in the cold each day. So consider buying food that is nutritious and is going to actually fuel your body and you'll probably spend a lot less money on snacks etc up the mountain that you don't need. Some easy ways to save money on food are to only shop in supermarkets and not buy food in cafes up the mountain, not go out for food, and to cut out buying unnecessary junk food, fizzy drinks, etc. On the subject of things you may need or not need, we come to our next big cost issue, which is drinking. For a lot of you, if you've chosen to do your season because you're interested in the social aspect and the lifestyle, you may prioritize drinking and smoking as something you want to spend your money on. However, obviously this is a really easy way to save money if you don't do this. And even if you are going to drink, consider do you need to be drinking at the bar every night or can you just go buy your beers at the supermarket if you're going to hang out with the same friends at the bar as in your shared house anyway. Last kind of cost issue I'm going to talk about is your pass. So obviously a lot of resorts will do early bird passes. So I'd advise you look at the different lift passes available in the area you're looking to go to well in advance. Quite often you'll need to buy your pass well in advance. And there may also be multi-region passes available. So for example, if you're going to Tyrol in Austria and you want to ride some of the glaciers, pre-season or in the spring, but you also want to ride some of the winter resorts, there's actually one lift pass that will cover all of this for eight months. Last I'd say, even if it's just for one season, make sure you go out there, go do a season. It will change your life. It's one of the best decisions I've ever made. And I think it shows by how many people go back after planning to only do one season and go back and do more. It just shows how much fun it is.